Hello and welcome to episode 44 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's episode is John Frimgen, a mainstay bassist here in the Austin scene, who has performed with jazz luminaries such as Peter Erskine, Shelley Berg, Ernie Watts, Rick Margitza, and Christopher Cross, among others. John serves as the Associate Professor of Jazz Bass at the University of Texas at Austin and never seems to have a shortage of some of my favorite stories from the Austin scene over the years. In this episode, we talk about the lengths to which he went to avoid playing trombone. We also talk about sneaking his brother's Weather Report albums and all the way of a full circle moment to producing his first record with drummer Peter Erskine and a close call where his upright bass almost became an instrument of self-defense. So moving on to the releases of the week, the first one is one that we talk about a little bit in this episode. It's John's first album as a band leader called Meanwhile that came out in 2001 and it features the great Mitch Watkins on guitar and Peter Erskine on drums. Uh, you know, in this episode, we talk about how so much more came out of this album than originally was planned and just how much of it wasn't planned and how impressive that is knowing in hindsight. I mean, the album stands on its own, but it's always super special to kind of hear the insider things about how these records were made. So if you want to support this release directly, you can go over to viewpointrecords.com, the label in which he released the album under, and you can get a physical copy or you can support it on all of the online stores such as iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. And then of course it is available for streaming as well on Spotify, Apple Music, you name it, it's there. Uh, and then moving on to the second release of the week, the next one that we have comes from Michael Stevenson and Alexander Claffey. Uh, this is their second single off of a new project that's coming out called Michael Stevenson Meets the Alexander Claffey Trio. And this is, for all we know, it's probably the first jazz ballad that I ever learned and it's the first one certainly that I fell in love with uh, hearing the New York voices whenever I was in the seventh or eighth grade. So to hear this one with the beautiful vocals of Michael Stevenson is incredibly special and you should go support this directly, absolutely. Uh, this album is also going to feature Alexander Claffey, Michael Stevenson, or his stage name, Sonny Step. It'll feature Julius Rodriguez, Italy Morchi, and Benny Benak III, I believe amongst others. And it was recorded in the revered Rudy Van Gelder their studios in New York City. And then this is going to be a joint release from Cellar Live and LA Reserve that is featuring some of the most killing musicians on the scene right now up in the New York City area. So if you want to go and support these guys, you can go over to Instagram and follow their handles. You can follow at Sunny Step, and that link is right down here. And then if you want to follow Alexander Claffey as well and keep up with both of them and whenever more singles and the full album comes out, you can go over to at Claffey Bass. So now moving on to the Monks shows of the week that we have to plug. Of course, Monks has been the glue holding the Austin jazz scene together and has made a real big splash on the national jazz uh, stage or virtual stage, we can call it. And the first one we want to plug is the Eddie Hobazal Trio that is tonight, Thursday, May 13th. I believe there are still tickets available for a live studio audience, but you can certainly go over to facebook.com slash monksjazzclub or monksjazz.com. And then the next one we want to plug is not at the Pedernales station with the beautiful red brick, but it's at an equally beautiful room with a uh, stunning chandelier, which is Native Hostel, uh, just around the corner from where Pedernales station is. This is going to be Friday, May 14th, the Michael Malone Quartet. That one does still have some tickets available, so I would suggest going over and securing that for you right now. That's going to be tomorrow. Uh, the next one also has a live studio audience, and it's back at Pedernales Station. It is Sunday, May 16th, and it is Paolo Santos's senior recital requirement fulfillment for his undergraduate degree at the University of Texas at Austin. And then the last one we want to plug is the Peggy Stern Quintet, which is Tuesday, May 18th, and it is a continuation of the concert series series from Austin Jazz Society's Project Safety Net fundraiser series. Again, Project Safety Net is the initiative started by Austin Jazz Society to take care of the most vulnerable jazz musicians uh, here in Austin city limits uh, to get them onto the other side of the coronavirus pandemic. And like the old standard says, I'm beginning to see the light. And so fingers crossed, we keep heading towards that light and everything looks great going forward. So one thing that we also did want to mention is that this week Austin lost one of its brightest shining lights, a uh, drummer by the name of Scott Lanningham. And I only knew Scott through reputation uh, and his world cl class playing, but you can ask anyone in town and they would tell you that whether they knew him for a minute or they knew him for a decade, he always treated you with nothing but, uh, you know, the 
most overwhelming kindness and grace and never knew a stranger. And so in this time, uh, a GoFundMe has been started to help his family during this transition. And you can find that link down in the description of this video. And any and all donations uh, certainly help and are always appreciated. Um, I can't imagine what his family's going through at this time. And so just having the support of the Austin and greater jazz community uh, would really mean a whole lot to their family at this point. So if you feel inclined, that GoFundMe link is down below. So for now, we'll move into today's episode, which is episode 44, John Fremgen. This is Off the Bandstand. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to, to finally have you on for like a proper episode because we've done things like the, the holiday special and we've done things like the elephant stuff. And that's actually where yeah. I first heard the story of um, Scott coming in with the fanny pack and the life is good shirt. So whenever I read that yeah. yesterday, I was like, oh, this is cool to like see it written down too. Um, yeah. But it's exciting to, to have you on for a full uh, episode too because um, – you know, before I had even gotten to town uh, and I was in Lake Jackson, there were a few people's names that I people told me like, hey, these are these are the main people in Austin. And uh, even once I first got here, Matt Maldonado was like, we were on the way to a gig out of town. And he was like, hey, write down a bunch of names on your iPhone notes. And when I did, you know, I wrote down John Blondell, Mike Mordecai, and then Matt was like, you need to know who John Frimgen is as well. So it, in a way, nice. I was like, okay, I've been hearing about you for so long, and now it's nice to, to start to understand a little bit more of, of you and your music. And I went down the deep dive, and I started listening to uh, all of the records, so like Meanwhile, and If Not oh, Now, cool. and stuff. And I was listening to it a lot this morning, um, and I want to talk about that in a bit, but before <laughs> okay. I get there... I am very curious about you coming up in the Chicago area and where jazz started to make it into your view. Um, well, let's see. Honestly, you know, I grew, 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 up, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and my, my dad, it was really my dad. Um, he would come home, he would commute, you know, to, into the city every day and back he worked downtown and my dad was a kind of a self-taught pianist i mean i'm sure he had lessons but he really just kind of did his own thing and and like his prized possession he still has it actually it was his steinway he had this you okay. know steinway baby, baby grand and he would he would come home from work take the train home you know kiss my mom and then change out of his suit and put on his, you know, casual slacks, you know, whatever you guys sure. like wore back then. And then, and then he would pour himself a scotch and sit down and play tunes on the piano. And, you know, we could, I'd hear him doing it. It was a, a lot of times it was just in the background, but, uh, you know, he, he'd be back there playing like autumn leaves and moon glow hmm. and, um, you know, fly me to the moon and things like that. Just kind of, you know, in his way, you know, um, and that, that was sort of his way to wind down, but it kind of in the background, I was sort of picking up all of these, this music. Um, so, but then, you know, so then I kind of followed his lead and I started teaching myself how to play piano and guitar. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a terrible student. My, my mom tried to get my sister to give me piano lessons, you know, who okay. was, who you know who had take taken lessons and she could play i assume she and was older that, yeah she's eight years older than me okay and and she's actually in the industry in the music industry and in, 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 in broadway but okay. she and i are the, are the two that are in you know, the five kids in my family that you know are in the music industry 
but you know that didn't work <laughs> how she probably was like i don't want to teach this little asshole <laughs> and, then, and, I, and I, I just didn't practice but I, I ended up teaching myself and i taught myself guitar and then um you know then it was just like i think a lot of you know kid, suburban kids you you don't really get exposed to that kind of music to jazz you know out in those areas so much uh except for your school jazz bands mm -hmm. so you know i i was playing trombone that that was my instrument for for band because i didn't really know about bass yet and um so i wanted to play in the jazz band but i hated playing trombone and okay i, I mean i yeah, I can tell you how I ended up stop how I, how the my trombone career ended pretty abruptly, but but so I taught myself. So then I was like, okay, I want to play bass. So I bought a. Um, there used to be these, you know, back in the day, you would get these big catalogs from the big, you know, store Sears and Montgomery sure. Ward right before uh, like before christmas and they were like this big <laughs> and you just go through and there were yeah. every single thing they sold was in there and there was always a section with musical instruments and in the sears catalog they had um the, the silver tone guitars and basses and the basses mm -hmm. were called the, the memphis silver tone bass and it was like 37 dollars no. <laughs> and, and so i i i asked for a memphis silver tone bass and a 15 watt bass amp and they got it for me for christmas and i kind of taught myself how to play i took one lesson from this guy in town and um then i just sort of taught myself how to play and so i started playing bass i was still playing trombone in the bands but i started playing bass in the jazz band in the middle school and then i continued to do that into high school um and that was really that's kind of how i got my started started getting into that music there were some guys that were older than me that were that i kind of respected i kind of wanted to emulate a little bit you know as, as a bass player and they were playing they started gigging they started like playing around the chicago area and downtown one guy in particular larry kohut who's actually still he's one of the main you know upright players in chicago mm -hmm. uh, he was actually the bass player on prairie home companion okay yeah, so all, all those, you know, those upright bass things you heard on that was Larry. Okay. I, you know, I, I was, I, I, I kind of wanted to do kind of what he was doing. I wanted to, like, play gigs. I just didn't understand how to do it. So um, I, just, I found an upright bass in the band room at, in my high school, and my band director let me borrow it, and then got a, got a really great teacher, and, I, and then I just – I really took to it. How I practiced how, a lot. Yeah, how late in was high school was that? So that was the I, so the upright bass. I had I'd been playing electric bass since like the, the sixth grade. So the upright bass kind of fell into my hands in the middle of my freshman year in high school. Okay, and then um, and then I just dove in and then the problem was you know we only had a concert band and mm. there was no we didn't have an orchestra and i and he, I, I still had to play an instrument you know to be in yeah. band so right. i was still playing trombone and i ha I had braces and i hated it <laughs> and he, with or without the braces i hated playing trombone and um, um so <clears throat> he eventually let me play bass in the concert band like i would just play the tuba parts sure and um, because he just realized that, 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 you know, this was my instrument mm. and, and, but he made me play trombone in the marching band. Okay. And so that's, so that's how that, 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 that goes, that leads to my story about the end of my trombone career. Okay. I hated it. I hated it so much. I, I never cleaned it. I never put oil or grease on the slide. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and it was just like, you could barely move it. And I hated I hated marching with it. I hated playing it in the pep band in the stands. Yeah, I would. I would always pretend like I was playing it, but not play it. And he would. He'd say, "I, I can see you up there not playing." And, <laughs> and so finally, I just, you know, left it. And we were up on the bleachers, you know, d during the football game. And I just kind of 
left my horn precariously on the edge of the bleacher and it just oh, no. whoops it got knocked off and it <laughs> fell and it got bent and then i was like look you know look mr aaronsberger my band director i can't move the slide oh. <laughs> and so then he but then he made me play uh symbols in the march oh no <laughs> that was that was yeah that was the end of that was my senior year so i ended up i ended marching band in the percussion section and i still hated it but at least i wasn't playing the trombone sure. oh my god so yeah what so, was it but, what was it about like i guess it was it was a love of bass that made you from just quitting altogether because usually people wouldn't go to such extreme potentially expensive lengths to you know uh uh I, out. you know i i think probably it it was because it was so clear to me that i was supposed to play bass mm. like and I and I and honestly it got to a point where I resented that the trombone, which is probably why I still kind of you know pick on trombone players. So they're sort of my favorite target. I was gonna say there's something about there's something uh, organic or innate probably about you and John Blundell's relationship based on the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So he so he and I have a funny relationship because you know he's a phenomenal trombonist and a great bass player, and then you know I play and I. And there are very few bass players that, you know, survive, for lack of a better word, mm. as bl playing with Blondell for very long, you know. And, <laughs> I, and I have the dubious honor of probably being the longest lasting one. Like, as far <laughs> as I know, he would still hire me. Um, yeah. But, he, you know, so we do have that. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 you know, as far as secondary instruments go, you know, his bass playing is you know, great. And my, I could barely play anything on the trombone. So it's not mm. like that, but yeah, we kind of have, uh, you know, there's a little bit of familiarity, you know, because of that. But right. I, I'll tell you one time, I'll tell you a funny Blondell story. So one time, you know, he, he, he has his Tuesday night, the first Tuesday at the Alamo he had, we'll see mm. what happens when it reopens the first Tuesday of every month. And, you know, I was playing and it was a typical band. I think probably maybe Scott was on drums and me and Helmer and Carter Arrington. And, you know, we played a really good set and he's playing, you know, just tearing it up on the trombone, you know, yeah. like I don't even know how to describe what he does on the trombone, <laughs> but, um, like, like Eddie Van Halen on the trombone. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we were, I was at the bar during the, the first break and, and, having a drink and he came up and he patted me on the back and he said, Oh, John, you sound great. You sound great tonight. And I looked at him and I just, I just was kind of, I guess I was feeling feisty or whatever. And I said, you know, I appreciate that, but y you and I both know that when we're up there playing and you're playing the trombone, I'm playing bass. I know you're thinking in your mind, if only I could do both at the same time, I wouldn't have to hire this guy. <laughs> and he, and he kind of laughed and goes, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, dude! John Blondell stories are my favorite. Whenever you were like, "Yeah, I got a John Blondell story for you," I just like lit up, and I was like, "Man, I oh yeah, this is chock full." Everyone's got a Blondell stories. Oh man, yeah. I mean, my uh, my favorite John Blondell story. I think I've told you this one in the past, but it's um, we were of course at the Elephant. Um, it was like me, Mike, Maldonado, and 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 Blondell. I think Ben Trish was there, and he was just telling us about his time uh, in. I think he, whenever he was playing over in China and then came back and there was somebody on the kit, maybe at a Monday night jam, I can't remember exactly what the detail was, but uh, just said that this guy was really, really bad. And um, the way that he said he was bad was he was like, yeah, this, this motherfucker thought that time was a magazine and yeah. <laughs> like one of the best lines, I think, yeah. of all time. Yeah. It's like you can't even be mad. Like even if you were on the receiving end of that insult, like you can't help but laugh. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's, it's almost like a badge of honor to be on his shit list. Yeah. <laughs> at, at, at some point, you know, and, yeah. we, and I've been on it. Believe me, <laughs> he, sure. he would attest to it. For sure. So 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 basically, to finish the my you know my youth. Uh, so. No more trombone. And then it became clear that upright, you know, that, well, that bass in particular, but it became clear, clear to my parents that I was really taking to the upright, but I really didn't have any good direction. And my dad, mm. um, 
was on the board of the Chicago Symphony, I think, and he got the there was a, a ret, the retired principal bass player named Harold Siegel, an amazing orchestral bass player mm-hmm. who lived in downtown, um, agreed to li- to listen to me and to possibly give mm-hmm. me lessons, and he he was really old um, German, kind of you know grouchy German guy and for, he heard something in me and um, agreed to teach me so every week you know we would go downtown and I'd carry my pace down Michigan Avenue and I was like yeah like 90 pounds I was this little twerp in the space and I was walking down Michigan Avenue and you know the wind it's Chicago With a full size yeah well three quarters but it, I mean sure. my size it might as well have been a full size and every yeah, time the wind right. gust would hit it would like lift me off my <laughs> my ground but i would take i took lessons with him and he taught me he taught me really strict this really strict tech method called the smandel technique that a lot of you know bass players don't use anymore um which i don't agree with or whatever um mm. <laughs> that, but it's very rigid and and i hated it because it, it hurt and it would you know but it was meant to build up endurance and it was meant to to make pitch accuracy and mm. it was re- it's really designed it's like a nuts and bolts method and i realized years later that it's the best method for jazz players because mm. jazz players are always that we always have our fingers on the on the fingerboard where mm-hmm. you know so e- even orchestral music as hard as it can be you get a lot of rest you know you get, there's passages and then there's rest and mm-hmm. then there's you know and and Orchestral players, you know, they le- they learn music passage to passage, right? And then they mm-hmm. learn the fingerings and the bowings, and then the dynamics come when they rehearse. But it's you know we don't do that. We we the tune starts and everyone just expects the bass to be like right here the whole time. The whole time, yeah. So and so you need to have strength and endurance. So so anyway, so that was studying with Harold was great. I mean, he was really cruel to me once he got me in his studio. You know, he, sure. He, he yelled at me and cursed at me in German, like every, (laughs) every lesson. Uh, But, but it was really, it was really worth it. And then, so then I went, you know, to college and really it was in college when I, when I sort of found the the sort of path, at least in jazz that I wanted Mm -hmm. to take, you know, I, I always kind of have been on two musical trajectories, you know, the sort of acoustic jazz, music that i'm really drawn to and then there's just sort of the bass world you know the mm-hmm. electric and upright but just sort of uh, the bass sideman pop singer songwriter kind of thing right so and i was able to do both in college but i had a couple really important teachers um as an undergrad that really sort of kind of steered me towards the music that that i really wanted to kind of emulate and you know it was like miles davis yeah and bill evans and pat metheny you know because I, I never really heard any of that you know mm-hmm. this is bef- you know this is there wasn't youtube you know yeah, there wasn't right. the internet it was based you heard what was in your big brother's record collection or what this what the band director had in his, the library at the high school and what you heard on the radio and you definitely didn't hear any of that stuff on yeah. the radio. So what so. of the, what of jazz um, artists were you hearing in high school before you got to the collegiate level and you had more, a, a, a wider scope? Hmm. Um, not much. I, uh, <laughs> so Believe it or not, I, the only one I can think of, and this is really doesn't even that straight ahead, is Weather Report, and okay. that's because my my brother had a couple of Weather Report records, and and I used to, when he wasn't home, I used to go and pull his records out. He was he was really like anal about keeping his records clean. They used to have these record clean, you know, and and his little oil and stuff he put on and <laughs> clean it, and you make sure. And I was just like with his records on me, oh cool, cool, and and so I I remember listening to some Weather Report. And thinking that sounded cool, and I and you know someone told me that's jazz fusion, and but it was really the 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 playing in the big bands and listening to that kind of stuff, and then I I 
because I just took to it so easily, I started getting gigs. I got in, in particular, I got a gig with a wedding band that we would play, you know, the, the dance music during the reception. But before we would play a cocktail set and we would play standards. And I'm like, you know, 13, 14 years old playing standards, you know, and they were just like real book, like fake book kind of yeah, charts. Sure. And I, I, I just knew how to do it. I didn't understand why I didn't know any of the theory behind it. And I knew, I didn't know any of the history. Like I didn't know when we played um, on street, you know, that there was this famous cannibal Adderley version. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, or there's the Bill Evans way of doing it. You know what I mean? And that, that's, that kind of stuff came to me later. So I sort of, I kind of learned a lot of stuff backwards. Like I, I learned sort of like, I was almost like a stylist, you know, like I mm. could play this style and that style, but I, and I just could do it. And I'm sure I heard some, someone else do it and I picked up on it, but I didn't really he hear any of the source material, I guess you'd call it until yeah. I got to college. And my, my teachers were like, Oh, well, you got, you have to check out these recordings. And and, and yeah. I really like got into it. How do you feel that that influenced though, or, or not even influenced, how do you think that that contributed to a more um, unique and individual sound from an early age as opposed to where, I mean, people like me, we have the entire world, you know, of music at our disposal and we can kind of at any age pick up on any artist and then kind of start to copy. And then, you know, we see kind of towards the end of undergrad or beginning of you know graduate degrees where people start to really kind of come into their own sound most often um since you had kind of the opposite kind of situation how do you feel that that affected your sound well i i, I it, it will definitely made me a, a better technician i knew the bass really well mm -hmm. so and that's because it was constantly in my hands and my electric bass or my upright, but really my electric bass, it was, I always had it. And so if I was listening to the radio and they were playing a Steely Dan song, I'd be learning, learning it as I went. And when the TV, when they would go to a commercial on the TV, I had my bass and I'd be playing the commercial, like, <laughs> and, and without even thinking about it, I really learned the, the, the fingerboard. And I just, mm -hmm. I just, you know, my hands like just knew the instrument. So, in fact, I mean, it got to a point where when I got in trouble, the only way my mom could punish me, she couldn't ground me or anything because I'd, I'd be like, fine, I'll sit in my room and play my bass. <laughs> so the only way she could punish me was to lock my bass in a closet. Yeah. You know, for a week. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably how it affected my sound the most. I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't regret it because I feel like once I started, once I went to college and then, you know, all this theory and history and context was opened up to me, that was amazing. And I, and I feel like I didn't have to worry so much. So like a lot of my peers and, and were, were still kind of shedding. They were really mm. practicing like just technique. And, and I kind of had all that already down. I mean, not entirely, but yeah. But um, I could already play, you know, I mean, I, I was yeah. a pretty strong player. And so and so for me, like the first semester of college, as, as far as music classes go, was like I was like just like it was like being in a laboratory. I was like, wow, the, yeah. like music theory blew my mind. Yeah. I, I had never taken a theory class in my life. And the, like, un, like just having an actual explanation you know to all mm -hmm. these things that i that i was doing and all these things that i heard I was like, whoa this is pretty cool did that click for you or did it seem to make it more convoluted I th there's that story of like chet baker like being in the military band he goes in like the first day and just like shits all over the charts because he can't read the charts um and then he comes in the second day and he finally you know or not finally like just the second day he has it down and people were like oh what happened he was like no no no. i just listened and i i figured it out and played more by ear so did it make it more like oh this is muddying the waters or was it like finally the world makes sense no no it it it, it totally clicked it wasn't mm -hmm. yeah it was it was more the latter it was more you know it just really makes sense to me like mm -hmm. I, there really there was hardly i mean there are some things in 
in um you know like western harmony theory that i i think are convoluted any by design or sure you know that that you know are unnecessary but the basic idea of it clicked you mm -hmm. know it was really um kind of cool to me and as far as read i mean i was i could always read really well that was always something that i could do and that was just because of playing in the concert band in high school yeah because I, I could even read on the trombone i just couldn't get it out mm -hmm. <laughs> i i was so sh i was so little like i i couldn't reach the seventh position i okay. would have to throw the slide out to my shoe and then my sh and then kick it back so i could <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, that's so, funny. I just wasn't meant to play that instrument. Yeah, sure. Well, there's there's a, a quote from, uh, I believe it's Shelley Berg that says, John is a devoted student of the Bill Evans trios and his interactive playing is an extension of that influence. So did you find that whenever you did have, you know, kind of all of that music at your disposal in your undergrad and then going into your, I guess, uh, did you do your master's and doctorate at USC? Just my master's masters okay so then whenever you went in there were you finding that the person you attached most on to was like scott lafaro or because of the uh, fascination with the evans trios or was it somebody else um no you know i i have to say that um i as far as bass players go like the ray brown was the guy that i was always trying to sound like mm -hmm. um the Bill Evans trio, which to me was more like the sum of its parts. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't just LaFaro or just Paul Motion or just Bill Evans. It, you know, although, the, you know, they're all were great. Uh, it, that was more like I would love to be in a group where everyone's sensibilities were like this, but I didn't sure. necessarily want to play it like LaFaro did. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, I like the way Mark Johnson actually played in that trio. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Bill Evans. By that point, Bill Evans' was playing was diminished pretty, you know, by a sure. lot. You know, yeah, right, he, right. It was at the end there, um, but yeah, I mean, but yeah, Ray Brown. He was the guy that that I used. To, I used to go see him play at mm -hmm. Cadley. He he played like once every two months when he was in town. He was pretty much in town all the time at that point. Um, so he had like a, a steady gig at Catalina Bar and Grill with Benny Green and, mm. and Jeff Hamilton and Gene Harris did it one time. Um, yeah. So, you know, and Catalina is a small place. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, it, it I mean, it's, I guess they move now, but it really wasn't much bigger than like Cezanne in Houston. It was maybe, okay. maybe Cezanne and a half as far yeah. as the size of the room. So you were, no matter where you were, you were right up there. And so, yeah, I used to watch him play and it's like, wow. But but I studied with Shelley mm -hmm. at, at USC and and we we talked a lot about that because he knew that was the kind of group that I would want to play with, you know, that sure. kind of trio that's a little more conversational, you know. Yeah. And obviously yeah. that ended up happening right with meanwhile. Um and yeah. that seems like really kind of a full circle moment too that I was gonna ask about, uh, you know, from sneaking weather report records uh from your brother's room to cutting your first record <laughs> as a band leader with Peter Erskine. I mean, was there was there any sort of like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit? Or was it just kind of like, no, we're all here to do the thing and and we're all just going to play off each other's sensibilities? Or was there kind of an added pressure because it's someone who you'd been listening to since early youth? No, you know, um, the uh, actually the, the only pressure I remember about that record was after record mixing it mixing it was um <laughs> the um the the first mix it was a real it, it was hard for me because you know it was my record you know it was mm -hmm. under my name but i wanted to sound like a group i didn't want to sound like bass right but the uh, the engineer the mixing engineer who's a great engineer um is a drummer and he mm -hmm. he kept riding the drum i mean it was clear 
I listened to the what we were hoping to be the final mix of tunes, and the drums were just way too loud. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to say turn Peter Erskine down, but you know, turn Peter Erskine down. <laughs> so, so that was the only stress about it. No, I mean that that came together so effortlessly. He was in town. He was the guest artist for the the Longhorn Jazz Festival, and so mm-hmm. I just piggybacked. And honestly. Um, the story behind that is I, I, I was, so I, it was on this label called viewpoint records that mm-hmm. was this, this kind of patron of the arts guy, Jack rock, kind of a interesting guy who has this amazing, who built an amazing, uh, mostly analog studio, mm-hmm. and, you know, with vintage gear and everything and, and his house and up and off of sea park road. Um, so I had done a few records with other people up at that point. He, we got to know each other and he was like, yeah, let's do a record. And the idea, it was going to be three trios, like of all different players. So I, I had okay. already, I recorded, there was going to be a trio with Jeff Helmer and AD Mannion, who mm-hmm. I had been playing with a lot. And we hadn't recorded anything yet with that trio. And then we were, it was going to be three songs each, right? So three, okay songs by three trios sure. and then i did record some trio music with elias haslinger and jj johnson some kind of like you know sunny sunny rollins kind of stuff and um and then mitch and peter we were going to do the other three so so we really only had three songs okay to record so but we had all day so you know we got in there like at 11 o'clock and started playing and you know i had two originals a tune called bad back jack and peace for my sons mm-hmm. and um then i was like let's just do it. and then i picked the standard like i think my romance mm-hmm. so we we recorded all of those and they were all first takes you know it was like it sounds great we were really happy with it <laughs> and then i was just about to say well you know peter thanks man and he he's like let's keep recording and mm. And so then we just started picking, let's do solo, let's do this, let's do that. And then Peter's like, hey, man, I just wrote a tune um, that, I, I, that I haven't recorded yet. You want to do it? And, and he's like, he, he, so he, he, we had manuscript paper. He actually wrote it. He, he didn't have a copy of it. He wrote the chart out. And it was a 12-tone, groovy, kind of creepy swing tune. And that... We, that was meanwhile. That was that became mm-hmm. that was the tune. Meanwhile, that's what he called it. And so Mitch was Mitch read it, you know, and I, I, you know, I, kudos to him because guitar players <laughs> don't like reading music. And but Mitch like rose to the occasion and he read it. And if you listen to it, so that's the title track. If you listen to it, it to me that's kind of the coolest tune on the whole record. And it doesn't sound to me like we're reading, you know, just we're just playing this kind of quirky little head. That's the so, thing that's like most frustrating about the album because I I listened to it yesterday and then I listened to it again in its entirety this morning and I was just like man it, like part of the things that you know I don't like to have these episodes super scripted out but there's things that I I think about and I don't want to forget so I write it down and I literally wrote down you know uh, it's a trio of heavyweights um, and like the Bill Evans trio there's a great freedom in it and flexibility in the sound um, how quickly did, did that appear in your playing how premeditated were the charts or the vibe and or, or, or was it just something that was thrown together? And so while it is the best story to know that, that a lot of that was just very off the cuff, it's also infuriating yeah. just how much talent <laughs> was in the room, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and Peter, you know, I, I don't think I've ever sat down with a drummer, like, you know, got on with my bass with a drummer mm-hmm. ever and just immediately click like that. And I'm sure a lot of it has to do with just because I listened to so much of him, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he, and he felt it too. He, he, he was like, you know, we sound like we've been playing together for years. Mm-hmm. In fact, he did say that to me. And I said, well, I, in a way I have, you know, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, you know, I, Mitch and I at that point had been playing together for six or seven years. So we kind of knew each other's playing and Mitch knew Peter from, because passenger used to open up for mm-hmm. what the report. So he kind of knew him and they but they never played together. Um, but yeah, I attribute most of that to, to Peter, you know, I mean, he just, you know, cause the drums are always such, there's, there's, 
is kind of lead the way, you know. Right. And he's so like he he he, he leads the way with such an open, <laughs> you know, yeah. path. I mean, wow, such a man. The guy knows how to hit. Like he knows that how to hit a cymbal and how to hit a drum, you know. Mm. It's, it's not like a lot of guys; they just hit the exact same way. Yeah. It's like bam, 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 <laughs> sure, or sure. it's really soft, you know. But he just he he knows how to hit everything just right. Yeah. So that that was that was cool. The only one that we really um, talked about, and cause just we wanted to have it the vibe and and everything was the tune "Peace for My Sons," because that was. <laughs> That wasn't like just like, you know, a jazz tune, even though it, it's, you know, there's nothing really crazy about it. But and and, I, and it, I, the vibe of it was inspired by one of Peter's tunes, Sweet Soul. OK, um, which if, if you ever I don't know if you've ever heard that, but just check it out. There's a there was a group called Bass Desires that Mark Johnson put together with Peter, John Schofield and John Abercrombie. OK. Or no, 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 no. Um, John Schofield and Bill Frizzell. Okay, and it is they did two records, and on one of the records, they did, there's a Peter's tune called "Sweet Soul," and mm. it's just this super slow, t- 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 ka, t- t- mm. ka, and like, and that guy can play slow, and and so I told him, I'm like, this is in three, not four, but I said I, I'm really feeling like a sweet soul kind of groove, mm-hmm. and he's like, okay, and and he, like he immediately, <laughs> if you listen to it, it's like ah. And he told me, I remember when we finished recording it, he goes, that was a manly tempo. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you ben, know, most people assu- associate that with playing fast, but to, P- to Peter, manly tempos are, if you can hold down a slow one. Yeah. Well, it's like it's the whole funny. thing, kind of, kind of the parallel of like, you know, being super emotionally available is like also like super manly too, you know, just like having that yeah. kind of that opposites uh, attract thing of, of, of convention. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad a lot of the things that, that we've been talking about are things that I had in my notes that have just really happened organically. You've led into. And one of the things that I had on there was peace for my sons. And whenever I went and listened to um, if not now uh, and listening to part two, I really wanted to know more about the inspiration for those tunes, which you kind of started talking about, but then especially part two, right? Um, it's just a seven minute, you know, super immersive uh, tune. So the title piece for my sons, and then having that come back two records later, or I guess one record later, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, how, what, what was the inspiration behind that tune and the uh, uh, um, reasoning for bringing it back uh, on the third record? Um, boy, I'm trying to think about that one. So, I, I, yeah, I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about piece from a, actually the, what inspired me to write that tune was a Jeff Buckley song. Okay. Um, the, uh, lover you better lover you never came over i don't know if okay. you know that it's a I don't. it's a it's an amazing epic you know like, like a lot of his tunes were kind of these epic just like theatrical mm. you know pop masterpieces and 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 i was really into i still am into jeff buckley but so i like there was a certain thing where he kept going um uh, to the minor four chord, you know, which isn't that big of a deal. Mm. Like the, I mean, the, the Beatles did it all the time, but, yeah, sure. but in that context, it was cause you know, you know, the Beatles, it was like, ding, 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 the minor four. But with Jeff Buckley, it was like, ding, 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 minor four. And it was just like, Oh yeah. And so I was like, I, I, I can kind of hear that. And so I started writing this tune in my head and, um, with that and there were a couple other little quirky things into the like but then and i hadn't titled it and then um i added this little section at the end this sort of outro that kind of goes into kind of a weird groovy sango thing Mm -hmm. and then there's just it just gets kind of cacophonous and pianos all over i I told helmer just you know play don't even try to play tonal and which of course he still he made not playing tonal sound tonal you know yeah um, and 
so it wasn't titled when we recorded it. And then we finished it. I listening back to it. I was like, it has that sweet soul drum groove. And it's got this kind of cacophonous outro, like Peace for My Sons did. I just immediately thought, oh, Peace for My Sons part two. Interesting. So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of where that came from. It's kind of even like, I mean, not to say that somebody planning, you know, a kind of succession of a tune is uh, not great, but that's kind of even more special and, and organic that it's recognizing that it came from the same kind of place, right? And you're like, oh, this just feels kind of a continuation of yeah. a story. Um, I, it, <laughs> I almost liken it to, you know, um, movies that just need need multiple movies to to have the storyline as opposed to yeah. um anchorman where they're like all right you know we made anchorman and then now 20 years later not 20 years what like 15 13 years later we're gonna make another anchorman because it was such a hit you know as opposed to um making something that is just like oh this is organically this as opposed to trying yeah. to, to you know what i'm saying yeah and, and i'm i'm better at that and as far as the like writing music and, and even like when i because i've done a bunch of like big band arrangements as well mm -hmm. but like i'm no good at if someone like hired me to write a specific song or to write a specific arrangement like i'm not john mills you, mm -hmm. you, if you did if you hired john mills if you told him you know write me a steely dan song he, he mm -hmm. would do he would have it with you like in two hours yeah, or or write me like a you know an Ellington esque a big band arrangement of this tune. You have it to you by in a week, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Like mm -hmm. I, I I would just get completely like blocked. So pretty much everything I write just sort of comes, and mostly at the piano. I just at the piano. I'm like, oh okay, this kind of sounds cool, and then I can kind of hear it. And then it just sort of like I, I have no agenda until I'm way, way into it. Yeah. And, 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 and then usually I name them after, you know, it's like, OK, this should be called this. Do you have very clear um, imagery in your head whenever you're making stuff or is it Sometimes. really just kind of a fundamental? Sometimes I do. Um, uh, m more more recently than than, you know, back in the day. Um, trying to think I, probably the the tunes that i wrote on um if not now have the most imagery i think mm -hmm. so um yeah but i i wrote a couple boy i wrote one right before the pandemic um called get got that we <laughs> that, that, that i wrote it um for the kirk covington devil horns and we played it mm -hmm on the we premiered it at the last gig at the elephant before the pandemic. And I mean, you know, I, I'm usually, I hear my music and I'm like, it's kind of like hearing your voice, uh, on, you know, recorded. It's like, eh, I don't really want to hear that again, but sure. I really, I, we, we finished that tune and it, it was like, wow, this was cool. And yeah. John, and, and I knew it was cool because John Mills came up to me at, during, we played at the end of the set and Mills came up to me during the break and goes, you don't deserve to write a song that cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're stepping on so, John's territory. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, I'm, I feel like, and, and it's probably because I don't write as much. I, I went through a real writing phase, you know, in like two early two thousands up to maybe 2008 or seven. And, um, you know, I was churning out a lot of stuff. And I think now, because I only write sporadically, it means more mm. and I can, there's maybe more imagery in what I write. Yeah, for sure. There's also um, a quote that I really like. And um, Jay Trachtenberg uses one of my favorite SAT uh, GRE words whenever he says that, uh, quote, uh, bassist John Frimgen has been ubiquitous of late as a producer and band member on other people's recordings and club gigs, right. but meanwhile uh, gives him an opportunity to step into the spotlight as a band leader and accomplished uh, soloist. And um, both on meanwhile, and I mean, that's whenever he wrote that quote, but especially too on uh, if not now, I mean, if nothing else, and there is so much more, but if nothing else, you know, there's uh, uh the the tone feels very inspired 
um, it, it doesn't feel like anything is is uh, being fabricated for the sense of like, oh, I'm going for this vibe. No, it, it feels very genuine. Um, and I am curious because you said that, um, excuse me, um, you said that whenever you had made, meanwhile, that was hard for you to kind of deal with the mixing process. Um, yeah. But I also saw that, I think it was in the same <laughs> Jay quote, uh, just saying that you had been doing some producing work on other people's records. So uh, how have you approached being a producer on other people's projects? And then how does that translate to your own as well? Uh, well, I mean, I've, I've only done it, I haven't done that much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of approach it, but usually I'm playing mm -hmm. at something that I've, in fact, the only times I've ever produced or co-produced I was also playing bass on. Mm -hmm. So I kind of approach it from a player's perspective. And, you know, so, so a lot, so often I'll be in the studio, um, like, you know, I, I, I don't know how deep you delved into my, my, um, you know, discography or whatever, but mm -hmm. I, I, I have played bass. I've been the, you know, the main bass player since like 1991 for an artist named PJ Olson, mm -hmm. who, is a uh, really probably the most one of the most talented musicians I've ever known, and he's mm -hmm. like a brother to me. Um, but he he's currently he's the singer for the Alan Parsons Project, but okay, he's he, he's put out five or six records. We were on Sony Columbia for a while, and then um, it, uh, we're on. I can't remember what labels he's been on, but we've done sure. quite a few records. And, you know, before, you know, recording things remotely and, you know, that kind of thing became a, a feasible thing, you know, we'd all have to go to LA to record. Mm -hmm. So from like 90, when I moved to Austin from like between 90, 95 and 2004 or five, I would, you know, anytime he'd do a record, I'd be going out to LA to, mm -hmm. to work with him. And I would really be, I was really the only guy who, that he, in the studio, he had these great players, but none of them, you know, could read music, could read charts. And, but not, not so much that they didn't understand his whole approach. You know, he mm -hmm. was very um, verbal and he used a lot of imagery in mm -hmm. what he wanted. So, you know, he wouldn't say, okay, this is going to go, D minor, B flat, A7, and it's going to go to G minor, and then I want it to be like kind of a, a, a cool backbeat. He couldn't say mm -hmm. that. He'd be like, sure. okay, it's going to be boom, 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 boom. It's going to be, <laughs> like he would, yeah. he, you know, he, he had this sort of language, and I knew it. I, I just, I could, so I would, I was like the translator mm -hmm. in, this, in, this, in the recording studio for all these guys who, you know, you know, they were all business, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. what do we do here? You have to tell me what to do. And it's like, he can't tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, all right, yeah, you play this chord, you play that chord, and it's going to be this kind of beat. And, and, and I, I did that. And when we rehearsed for touring too, I, I would mm -hmm. do that. So I kind of began, and, and, you know, I found out later that, you know, they, they made me the session leader on all those records, mm. which, you know, which means you end up getting a little more money, you know, when the, the mailbox money comes yeah, in, which sure. is kind of cool. But, you know, so I kind of treat producing that way, like kind mm -hmm. of like translating, you know, and, and I've done some stuff with like singer songwriters in Austin and it's been kind of the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. if you can find a way to bridge the gap, between what we know as musicians and you know what what we know always works and mm -hmm. the things that we have terms for you know that are like sort of set in stone if you can bridge the gap between that and the sort of you know world of the creative you know troubadour sure. um that can't that doesn't speak that language um you you can you know you could be really significant i mean you can be a real important you know, part of that process. And so that's, you know, I, I learned that with mostly working with PJ, but I, I do, I do, that's kind of how I would approach producing with anyone. Do you, do you like that more having someone who maybe doesn't have the, um, vernacular feels like a, a weird word, uh, to use for it, but like someone, someone who has 
a very clear vision, but maybe can't articulate quite, but is able to give enough descriptors to, to accomplish like translating to, to you at least. So that way you can translate to everybody else. Do you like that kind of process? I know this is kind of putting it on the spot with PJ. I mean, that you've worked with a lot and you don't want to just be like, no, I hate doing it. Cause it's like singling out. But, yeah. um, but I, I, in one way I can see how that can be frustrating for some musicians, but in another way, I see how that can be really nice because whenever you want to put together charts, a record music in general, you want somebody to feel strongly about something and have, uh, have a clear vision. So um, d does that kind of become like an extra fun little challenge deciphering that? Uh, oh, oh, you know, yeah. As long as I, 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 you know, think the music is quality, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so sure. Yeah. If I like the music and, and I feel like it, it's important enough to, to, to make the effort, Mm -hmm. you know um but yeah if it's if it's someone who doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't know how to communicate and they really aren't have much to say anyway then it's it can be kind of frustrating and yeah. and a lot of times it's um like it's rehearsing with people mm -hmm. like that that can be a real real drag you know mm -hmm. so like when rehearsing for pj's tours you know it, it wasn't like a lot of sideman work where you know you've got the charts on your ipad you know you, you, you can look at them in the rehearsal you got to memorize it for the concerts or whatever mm -hmm. but it's all laid out there and we've got board recordings you can hear how things are supposed to sound with pj stuff it was all always fresh out of the studio yeah. and you'd listen to his recordings you know if you listen to his music you know what i'm saying it's it's like what do i do you know there's so <laughs> much going on it was very it was like Peter Gabriel meets Seal, you know, it was very okay. esoteric. And, and so there was a lot of letting him um, extrapolate, you know, and then yeah. sort of translating that to the guys and then making it sort of happen. Um, but it, that's, I never had an issue doing that because mm -hmm. I, I believe in the music so much. There have been situations um, where you know it's been the opposite where uh, someone who's they clearly are just you know jive you know and it's, it doesn't matter it doesn't it wouldn't matter if they knew exactly how to explain it it would still suck you know it yeah. would still yeah, yeah, it would yeah, still yeah. be it would still just not sound great so yeah. that can be frustrating sometimes i've been in those situations where i'm just like and, and i usually just take the opposite route I, I, in those situations i just kind of clam up i was like mm -hmm. put my head down i'm gonna get through this yeah right right right. um on the george martin uh project of in my life which is a ridiculously <laughs> uh uh versatile kind of uh bringing everybody into the fold i mean it's like jim carrey goldie hahn robin williams mm -hmm. uh uh phil collins sean connery like it's just a very kind of um diverse crew um did that project influence at all or bring more central to your mind being like oh let's do a not a lesser known but um to the layman maybe lesser known tune of dear prudence to if not now oh um no uh not that i mean it's funny you mentioned that because i was just i hadn't thought about that george martin thing in a long time and i was just on a gig with Larry Sire, who was the engineer mm -hmm. on that. And, and I, and I, and I brought it up. I'm like, you remember that George Martin thing? He goes, Oh yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that was, that was George. It, it was going to be his last, you know, he was retiring. Mm -hmm. So this was like in 97 or 98. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be the last thing he ever produced. And it was under his name. Um, and he, his idea was to have a bunch of famous people that he wanted to hear sing Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so Jim Carrey does I Am the Walrus. Yeah. And so the one we played on was um, Goldie Hawn singing uh, like a lounge version of It's Been a Hard Day's Night. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it was pretty funny. There, there was a, there's, a, there's actually a Bravo documentary on that. Yeah. So there was a camera crew in there. Um, there's a lot of funny stories about, about that session, you know, but, but uh, the, I'll tell you the, for me, 
you know, I was like, man, I'm going to work with George Martin. Mm-hmm. I, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. And it was at, we recorded it at Bismo, um, Ray, Ray Benson's studio, mm-hmm. um, down on, you know, Manshack and I pull in a park and I'm walking down the driveway thinking, okay, all right, be cool, be cool. You know, it's just, you know, it's just a session. It's just, and I look and there's one guy out having a smoke and it's George Martin. Oh my he's, God. He's just standing outside of the studio having a smoke. And he goes, hello, you must be the bass player. I was like, oh, oh shit. Okay. You know, what am I going to say to this guy? You know, and I just, I tried to be cool, but I'm sure I said something stupid. Mm. And um, yeah, and then, yeah, and then we, you know, we played and, and I learned that he doesn't, um, he doesn't do overdubs. He just does. He gets as many passes as he can, and he cuts and pastes. Mm-hmm. And oh, interesting! So okay. we did like eight or nine versions of it, and then with with, with the band and her singing. And he and mm-hmm. so the the end result on that record was his cut and pasted version of it. And then they in New York they add someone arranged some horns and they they made kind of big band backgrounds to it mm-hmm. but no that wasn't the, the reason i did dear prudence was um because i i because of meldow you know because okay. uh because he was he started doing you know in fact he did dear prudence on one of his records but he was mm-hmm. you know he was bringing he was bringing all these kind of rock like paul simon tunes and radiohead mm-hmm. and um you know sound garden tunes and stuff like that onto these jazz yeah. records. So I, I thought it would be cool to do that, but because he had done it, I mean, it, you know, if he hadn't had, had done his version of it, I probably would have done a, that as just a trio or maybe a quartet with Mitch, but you know, because he had done it the way he did it, I wanted it to be different. I didn't want to sound like I was copying him. So sure. that's why there's, I mean, there's, there's organ, there's, dobro <laughs> there's mm-hmm. um i think there's some soprano sax and and i even uh jim volentine the um if you listen close J- jim had a sample of the um the old uh what was that uh uh God, what was that called that that tape loop machine that the beatles used to use okay um uh not it's not theremin theremin is you know this thing but it's sound sure. it, anyway i can't remember the name of it but he he had samples of, of the beatles actual thing of Whoa. of their okay. of their those flutes that they used on strawberry fields mm-hmm. <laughs> and so um and so because it was a sample i could you know play whatever pitches on the keyboard so i actually played i used that tape loop and sample and i played like beatles flutes in the back. So, so if you listen really, if you listen with headphones, you can hear this, and it sounds just like Strawberry Fields. It's funny that you say that because I was literally, I, that's how I was listening to it with these headphones. And uh, I heard that and I was like, man, they they really went for the authentic vibe. Yeah. Like, that's like, that's it. And that's funny to hear that. Yeah, that's why I did that. I wanted to make it sound a little more layered and like produced mm-hmm. because I felt like if I went the other way, people would just say, oh, he's just copying Meldow. Sure. Man, so interesting. Man, so I'm so curious now that I know all of the, um, or not all of the, but like a lot of the influences and the things that like uh, decisions that went into play for your different records. Um, you know, a couple of the the last questions that we ask are, who are you listening to maybe now or just like kind of evergreen records for you that you're just like I, I love this record. Everybody should go check this out as soon as this episode is over. Oh. Uh, uh, well, um, that's a, for me, it's, it's evergreen records because, you know, what I listen to now is really sporadic, mm-hmm. like, and not, you know, I'm just not jumping on, you know, anything, you know, necessarily because it's new, you know, that's sure. just not where my head is. But I would say as far as like evergreen records, um, I think We Want Miles mm. is a great Miles Davis record. Um, you know, it's like his the first in his funk uh, mm-hmm. period, but 
it's super cool. And then all of the in records. Okay. So, for, you know, working, cooking, relaxing, steaming, those, those ones, I still actually, you know, we'll listen to those mm-hmm. like a lot. Um, uh, built, so Bill Evans, Sunday at the Village Vanguard. Mm-hmm. And then there's one called the Tokyo Concert where Eddie, with Eddie Gomez mm-hmm. that, that was always, you know, pretty important to me. I always thought that was a cool one. Um, uh, Largo, Brad Meldow. Yeah. yeah. Largo was pretty much the inspiration for, um, if not now, for that, that record. That's so know. interesting. I was like, I, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to be blasphemous and you'd be like, that's pigeonholing or whatever. But, yeah. but the whole time I was listening to it, I was like, oh, this feels pretty, pretty Meldow, uh, ask pretty meldale inspired yeah oh totally um there's a great there's a lot of great ray brown trio records but there's one called live at scullers okay which i always kind of like kind of go back to uh, it's kind of my favorite and that was that's with the benny green trio mm-hmm. um and then you know on the rock side you know abbey road <laughs> yeah I, I i don't i can't imagine playing bass and not diving deep into that record mm-hmm. um you know abbey road uh shadows and light Joni mitchell okay yeah that's a great great record um live at leeds by the who is that was i learned how to play bass listen to you know playing along mm-hmm. with that record um and uh yeah, and then like bands like XTC, you know, and I I just like that kind of like British. All my all my pop stuff, all my pop tastes tend to go British, you know. I like yeah. Exile on Main Street by the Rolling Stones. Mm. Um, yeah, XTC. I do like Jeff Buckley, so there's an American pop guy that I do like, but unfortunately he's you know he's dead. But sure. But said Grace by Jeff Buckley. I, if it, you know, I would say if people haven't heard that record, that's a pretty important one too. Okay, very cool. Well, and then now this is my favorite question. This is the last question of every episode, and of course, you've already been privy to this because we've had an entire you know holiday episode of just this. But I always asked uh, if you had a significant gig from hell that you can recall where things go up the wall. Which one would you cite, and why? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I gave you my favorite, one of my favorites, right? The, um, the mall one, the, the, te- the, the teddy bear. <laughs> well, actually th- there's one that, um, it, it was, I-, I wasn't actually in the gig yet. I, there was one where I was schlepping my base. Um, this is God, this is way back when this is, I, I had a cell phone. It was a little, you know, a flip phone way before sure. iPhones and everything. So I'm walking in. We we're playing at the Four Seasons. Uh, it was like a, you know, an evening gig. And I, ha- I was in my tuxedo and it was already dark out. And I was walking down um, San Jacinto. I parked mm-hmm. up on San Jacinto. I was walking down to go to the hotel in my tuxedo. And as I'm going south on San Jacinto to the entrance of the Four Seasons, I look over. And there's a couple, a big, big dude with, you know, his hat on backwards and this little petite little girl. And they were, you know, were in, worrying at each other in Spanish. And then they were, you know, fighting, obviously. And then I get, I get right to the corner there at um, uh, Cesar Chavez, you know, yeah. San Jacinto. And then I hear some, you know, more, you know, telling noises and I look over and he's hitting her. Oh and I'm god. like, oh my god! And, and I got my bass, and and there's no. It's, I think it was like a. It was a weird night. It was a Sunday, so it was pretty dead out. And there yeah. was a lot going on over, over at like in the warehouse area, like a few blocks over. But it was pretty dead where we were, and and I I I mean I couldn't put my bass down on the street, and yeah. so I just I didn't know what to do. So I I opened my phone, my little flip phone with the, you know the light, and yeah. I said, hey. And I kind of showed him my phone. I'm like, "Hey, I'm calling the cops," you know. And, yeah. And um, and and, I, and actually, I did. I had I had called the cops, and I had you know the, the call, and I was telling them. And he and all of a sudden, the guy's like, you know, starts swearing at me and starts coming towards me. And I'm like, "Oh shit!" And I got my base, 
and just when I mean, he was like maybe cat corner of me at the intersection, um, three bike cops come hauling ass down San Jacinto, you know, with their little bike sirens. And, yeah. and he took off. He ran down. Um, he ran west over into the warehouse district. And she mm-hmm. took off, too. She took off towards 35. And so the bike cops get there and I'm standing there by myself. <laughs> And, and they're like, they t- asked me to tell them what happened. And they said, des- and I said, yeah, they, they said, describe them. I said, well, she's, you know, kind of, kind of slight and she had a skirt and he kind of beat her up and she went towards 35. And, and I said, he's really big. He's got, you know, a red baseball hat, jean shorts, big dude. He went over the warehouse district. Uh-huh. So they're like, okay, stay here. Don't leave. And so I, I, I had to stand there with my base and I was like, should I just, and I'm going to be late for the gig, you know? Yeah. Like, what should I do here? And, but I felt like I needed to stay. And, um, like 25 minutes later, the, one of the bike cops came back and he was like huffing and puffing. He's like, okay, we, we want to make sure we have the, your, your statement, you know, correct before we go on, because there's some discrepan- discrepancies and, and I'm like, oh, okay. And he said, so you said that a man was beating up his girl and then she went east. We, we said, we have her. We found her, and we, we, we've got medical attention for her. He said, and then you said the man went west and was wearing a red hat and everything. He said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, okay, well, so we apprehended the sus- suspect based on your description, and he put up a big fight. It took three of us to take her down. And I said, Whoa. okay. And he said, but the problem is it's not a man. It's a woman. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, wait, what do you mean? And he said, no, the the, the suspect you described is it turns out to be a woman and I'm like, no way. And he, he said, I said, what was she wearing? And he told me, and I said, yeah, that's her. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So it was, you know, a, a, a female couple. And, but yeah. man, I mean, she still would have killed me. I mean, she yeah. was big, scary, <laughs> but yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So that, yeah. So then they took my info and then I went in and I got, I got, called to go to an arraignment like three months later but what? thank god i was in la i was actually rehearsing to go on tour with pj olsen yeah in la for the summer so thank god i i couldn't i, I told him i'm like i can't be there and then they, yeah they did I, I was like i didn't want to see that that person again and she yeah probably buy me and kill you don't me. want to give <laughs> any any uh, uh further reason for them to ruin yeah. Your face, yeah. right? exactly yeah Jesus. Wow. <laughs> that, that is a, that is a gig from hell, man. Usually they're all like, Oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Ha ha ha. That one's like, Oh my God. Yeah, like, I know that. That yeah. was scary. <laughs> Jesus. Well, John, man, thank you so much for coming on. You never have any shortage of, of crazy stories. So yeah. I'm sure when Christmas comes back around, I'll have you back on if nothing else, yeah. just to retell the, <laughs> retell. absolutely that mechanical if nobody's heard that already everybody listening go and check out the holiday special and and hear him talk about (laughs) everyone preferring a mechanical bear with a hat falling off continuously (laughs) to did did that did you air that like did you release that as a thing yeah it made it in there yeah so check that out anyways people gotta go listen to it but man John, thank you so much for coming on, man. I'll sure. look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully sometime soon uh, yeah. at, at the Elephant, probably. And yeah. uh, have a great day, man. All right, man. Thanks. All right, peace. Bye.